Paul, as always. Um, we're going to have an interesting talk today. Um, we're going to think about the idea of the word government. Because a lot of people hear the word government and don't quite know what that means. So we're going to explore a little bit today about what the government actually is, what they do, what their purpose is, are they doing a good job as such, and do we think they're doing the right thing, um, and do we agree with some of their decisions. What's really interesting about what we're going to explore today is there isn't a right answer, and I've said this multiple times to multiple people when they ask me stuff like this, there is no right answer. It's why everybody does it differently. It's why every party does it differently. It's why every country does it differently. If there was a simple answer to this, every government in the world would be run identical and we would have an amazing world. But that's not reality. Let's have a little look. <clears throat> so the first thing I've, I've written on a slide with a big question mark is, I wanna hear from you guys. I wanna hear what you think the role of government is. Um, you can write it in the chat, you can shout out. Someone give me an idea of what they think the role of a government is. Winman, off you go. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. So a government is a group of people, um, a group of not only normal people, like your human beings, but important people who can decide whether to do this or do that. So being okay. part of the government it can um, benefit benefit you in different ways. I love the use can... of I love the use of important people. Um, up for uh, debate that one, but that would take us a whole different lecture series on that word alone. Uh, Kyra, I'd say a group that works on utilizing and benefiting their people instead of looking for corruption and money making, which isn't true for now, but you yeah, because that, that that's really interesting because when you say that, I was thinking about this earlier and I was asking myself what direction I wanted to go in with this talk, because there's millions of directions we could go in. And I didn't want to go into the idea of sort of touching on conspiracy theories, which you'll see all over the all over the news. But I want to tell you something really interesting. Barack Obama, very famous president of America, since he stopped being president, he's earned 70 million pounds. Boris Johnson earned more in his first day um, after being prime minister of the UK than he had previously in his whole career. So it really makes you think. Some people will rather cynically say, and I'm not saying they're right or wrong, not everybody might be in politics for the right reasons. Why? Because there's huge financial reward in it um, when you come out the other side. Barack Obama made £15.6 million pounds in one day after he became uh, president, which was scary information. But it just lets you know that maybe some of these people, because of the financial rewards at the end of it, that's why we know for certain not all politicians are in it for the right reasons. We have to hope that they all are in it for the right reasons, but it's clear history tells us that they aren't all in it for the right reasons. But I want to tell you what I think about the opening question. The role of government is to look after their citizens, and that can mean multiple things. So their job is to ensure that they provide the right conditions, safety, security, and a good life for the people of that country, my opinion. But I wanted to show you something rather interesting. The UK government actually state on their website what they see their job as, which I didn't actually, I've never seen this written down before until I did some research. This is what the UK government says a government job is and what, what does the government do directly from the UK government website. The government is responsible for deciding how the country is run and for managing things day to day. They set taxes, choose what to spend public money on, and decide how best to deliver public services, such as the National Health Service, for those of you not familiar, that's the hospital and healthcare service in the UK, the police and armed forces, welfare benefits like the state pension, as well as unemployment and disability benefits, and the UK's energy supply. So that was sort of how the government themselves 
This isn't my words. This is their words. This is what they see as their job, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and I wanted to think about this question here. They've said lots of things. They've got four key points. And I want to think, what should a government's priorities be? Because there's no agreed answer in this. OK, I will come at this from my perspective. OK, I've tried to be partisan, but you all know how much fairness and equality means to me. I said all the time, so I can't not. That will always come across in what I talk about. But I want you to think, what should their priorities be? And the reason I ask you this question is because we have a rule in life. And I said this in the PPE society, society a week ago. The rule in life we have is that we have unlimited wants, but limited resources. If anyone's ever studied economics or, or, or if you're going to study it in the future, you should. this is the key principle. As a society, as a country and as individuals, we have unlimited wants. We all want lots of things. Some of you want to have a nice car, a nice home, a swimming pool, a Ferrari, a Porsche. Some of you would like to solve all of the world's problems. Some of you would like to solve homelessness. Some of you would like to solve uh, all the health conditions in the world. Some of you would like to look after the uh, mental health of people and you'd like to prioritize that. But we have a problem, folks. We have limited resources and a resource can mean multiple things. Essentially, we're talking about what the government has available to deal with this, whether it's people, whether it's skill set, whether it is money, because actually there is the government has a, a limited amount of money. Some people will say, yeah, but 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 why don't they just print more? And I get this question all the time. Well, why don't they just print more money? They're the government, because actually the government own the money printing machine. So if they want to hit run and make an extra million, billion, trillion, they can do that. Just hit go, bang, 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 loads of money pops out. Woohoo, give it to everybody. <clears throat> but the problem with doing with that, countries have thought about doing that before and thought it was a good idea. That's a really bad idea. Zimbabwe did that. And Zimbabwe did that. And the price of a loaf of bread in Zimbabwe went from $1 to five trillion dollars five trillion dollars in like months and the problem with that is well what what, what is money they're just making up numbers they decided to go from pounds to thousands to hundreds to thousands to millions to tens of millions to hundreds of millions to to billions and then they get into multiple billions to, they were printing out notes just for the sake of it and then it was trillions so it got to the stage that money had no value because this is the thing you have to remember why does money have a value Money has a value because it is limited in supply. It is why things like gold, it is why things like pieces of art, it is why the Mona Lisa, it is why all of these famous historical things have a value. It's why some of you will be interested in Bitcoin in today's world. Bitcoin has a value because there's only 21, bill, 21 million Bitcoins in the world. There'll never be more of them. A very famous footballers have a huge value. Namor a player that plays for Paris Saint-Germain, bought from uh, Barcelona a few years ago. He was bought for $222 million, the most expensive footballer ever. Why? Because there's only one Neymar. Everybody plays football. There's not many really, 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 really good footballers. That's why people like Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, Kylian Mbappe, they're all earning two to three million pounds a week because they're so good. Think of the population of the world. 8 billion people, but there's only one or two or three or 10 that's really, really good. So I come back to why I'm saying this. There is a limited resource. OK, so the government has a specific amount of money. They don't have unlimited money. And there is something you have to understand called opportunity cost. And when I ask about priorities, my priorities and your priorities won't be the same. Because maybe my priority is that the government should give, because both of my parents are now at the age where they're on the pension, the UK state pension, which just happens in most countries when you get to a certain age. Because you've paid your taxes your whole life, the government give you money for, the, for your remaining years because you're too old basically to work. Because one of my priorities would be that I want people in the pension to get more money every week so they have a good standard of life. But that's almost from a selfish perspective. Why? Because my both of my parents receive the pension. And some of you, 
that maybe has got parents or family members with health conditions would like more money to be invested in that. But again, I'm a teacher. So from a selfish perspective, I'd like them to prioritize education. Why? Because I want kids to get the best possible education. Some people think they should prioritize the military, the defense, because they don't want to happen here what happened in, in Ukraine a number of years ago. And something else is really important called foreign aid. Does anyone know what we mean by foreign aid? Has anyone ever heard of this term before? This is actually the money which is allocated to supporting people in other countries that are in a less fortunate position. So at the moment, the UK will have given money to Turkey, to Syria, to the people of Ukraine. Why? Because it's the morally right thing to do. Personally, I think this is brilliant. Personally, why? Because then people's lives are significantly worse than mine. They don't have homes, they don't have facilities, maybe they don't have food. But this is a personal opinion. You will hear certain people saying that the priority should be on looking after people at home first. They shouldn't be given 1% of all the government's money. At the moment, they aim to give about 0.8% which is sounds like not that much money, but it's a lot of money. They should. Some people think that money should go to hospitals and schools inside this country. But actually, things may be bad at times in this country, but it's a lot worse elsewhere. So maybe as a wealthier nation, we should be helping others. So the reason I'm dancing around this question is because I don't have an answer. I've studied this stuff for over 20 years now, and I don't know the answer. I have my own personal views because they can't prioritize everything. They can't prioritize education. They can prioritize homelessness. They can prioritize health. They can prioritize the police. They can prioritize military. They can prioritize help in other countries. So this is why governments have to make tough decisions and they have to decide what the priority should be. And that's difficult. That's not easy. And sometimes they make decisions that are not in the best interest of their citizens. They make decisions which are in the interest of personal gain, self-interest. When we talk about making decisions in the interest of self-interest, they do things because they know it's going to benefit them. It will help them win votes in the future instead of doing what they think is the morally right thing to do. I just want to pause on that for a second. I just want you to reflect on that. What should their priorities be? Again, as I said at the beginning, there is no right answer. Just what we have to recognize is they can't solve every problem straight away. It's a really interesting dilemma. Because all of you would like to support other people. You'd like to help charities. You'd like to help um, people in your local community. You'd like to help the elderly. You'd like to help X, Y, and Z. But you've only got a certain amount of time in the day. So you can't do everything. You can't help everyone. It's a wee bit like the government. And we're going to get into some more interesting stuff in a wee second. This is really interesting. Again, Mr. Boylan likes doing these talks because Mr. Boylan thinks he knows lots, but he has to check if he, what he thinks he knows is right. So he has to do some research. And what I what the, re, what the reason I say that, the reason that's so interesting, because what I find from the internet is it is full of different information. When I type something into the internet, I find seven things. I want to check out the corporation tax in the Ivory Coast. Good luck with that, people. Uh, because look at the amount of different figures you get. Uh, I think I find seven different figures in the last 24 hours of what the corporation tax is. And the reason I say that is, is I will only ever give you information that I can verify that is I believe is accurate. And that means I've checked it in more than one place. So the first thing you see on the internet, just because it's on the internet, I've got a wee secret for you. It doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> so always check multiple places. So, so, so the reason I, I say that, I want you to think about this. There are 16 countries in the world you do not have to pay any income tax in. What does that mean? Income tax is the tax which you pay on your wages. So people in a country that have a job, you have to pay tax on your wages. And that tax goes to the government. And the government use that money to support 
lots of things, which we're going to touch on in a second. The gov- that's the money the government has to spend in that country. But actually, there's 16 countries that don't pay any uh, income tax at all. And these countries are a small dog has a right. These countries are for multiple reasons, but one of them is because they're so wealthy. The government has got such valuable assets, oil rich countries, for example, the United Arab Emirates, hugely wealthy country, huge oil wealth in this country. So they don't have to get that money from the citizens because the government owns a lot of the resources and the government brings in a lot of the money. But the UK government, if you earn in the UK over £150,000, and people say bad things about footballers all the time, but footballers, for every pound they earn over £150,000, give 45p back to the country. So they give 45% of all their earnings over £150,000. And most of you will look at that and think, well, £150,000 is a lot of money. You'd, you'd, you'd have a nice life on £3,000 a week, so you could probably afford it. So what the UK has got is a system where the more you earn, the more you're expected to contribute. But others would argue that that's not fair. Others would argue that that shouldn't be the case. If I earn more, I should be allowed to keep more. Why should I have to pay more and everybody else pay less? That's the view of some people. And the reason I say that is because this is the dilemma governments have. They have to decide what rules to set. And not everybody's going to agree because we all have a different view in the situation. We all have a different reading on the situation. So in the UK, you can see people that earn very small amounts of money, so that earn about £250 a week, they don't pay any tax. Then those that earn between about £250 and £1,000 a week pay about a 20% tax on all their earnings. And the more you earn, the more tax you will pay. Um, and the question is, why is that? Well, some countries are so wealthy from the natural resources, and it tends to be the oil-rich countries, they don't need this income. Whereas the UK government, the only income they really have is from the income tax which uh, individuals pay and the taxes which are charged on other things. Now, this is a really interesting question because, again, it's getting you to think about something. If you ever have me as a teacher, you will know one thing. I never give you the answer. My job is not to give you the answer. My job today is not to give you an answer. My job today is to get you to think. My job is to get you to think about these different scenarios and think about what you think is right. Because most things in the world of business, the world of economics, the world of politics, there isn't an answer. You just need to understand the information and think about that answer. So the reason I I give you this is there's three ways in which the government can control an economy. We have got uh, a planned economy, which is uh, where the government essentially own all of the assets and the government control everything. The government decide everything that happens in that country. They essentially have full control. You have a free market economy in which the government has minimal impact in the economy and just lets it sort itself out. And then you have what the UK has, which is a plan, sorry, a mixed economy, which is a combination of both some government intervention and some where the market's allowed to settle itself. For example, the market decides how much we pay for an iPhone. We decide that. If they set the price of an iPhone at £20,000, no one's probably going to buy it. But they figured out if they charge just over a thousand pounds, they can still sell it. The same with PlayStations or TVs, whatever it may be. But the question we have to think about, folks, is what, how much involvement should they have? And someone once asked me, well, they should have no involvement, and that's not possible. If the government have no involvement in a country at all, that's not good. Because we need the government for one key thing, no matter what. What thing does all, what is the thing which all governments need to be there for? What must they provide in all countries? What's the one key thing all countries need from a government? What does all citizens need from the government? One key thing, what is it? Yes, Christian has got it right. Law and order. Without the government, there's no law. 
and I want you to, somebody says, oh, well, but we'd be fine. No, we wouldn't. Would you want the fact that someone could rob your house and nothing you can do about it? Would you like the fact that someone can drive around um, if they're drunk and there's nothing you can do about it? Would you like the fact that people can say nasty things to you and there's no rules? Would you like the fact that violence wouldn't be, uh, would be allowed? Of course not. So in all scenarios, the one thing almost everybody agrees on is that government play a fundamental role in ensuring we have law and order so people can live safely. And I would love to meet someone who disagrees with that because they're probably, well, I can tell you, I said it's all about opinions. If someone thinks we don't need law and order, they're just wrong. <laughs> I think we, no one would feel very safe if there was no law and order. We need law and order. We need to know that we can live comfortably in our homes and the government's here to, with the police and the military or whoever it may be to keep us safe. But I've, I've came to some other really interesting conclusions. I want you to have a little look at this. Now. The UK government like to take quite a bit of money off us. They like tax and everything. They put loads of tax and everything. They tax our income. They tax businesses' profits. They tax everything we spend in a shop as tax. But they, there's four things they've decided to be super aggressive with. If you're not sure what I mean by aggressive, they tax these things heavily. And I mean unbelievably heavily and i'll blow your mind in the next step in the next slide we'll be like what um so these four things the government penalize or tax more heavily than anything else a sugar tax this means that in the uk if i drink a can of coke a full fat can of coke full sugar they charge a 20 percent tax on that cigarettes i'm going to leave for a second because you're going to be i want to keep that for the next slide um fuel what all of them things have in common alcohol is one thing they all have in common what does all of them things have in common what does them four things have in common why do you think the government tax them particularly why do they single out these four things and tax them really heavily what have they got in common uh i'll hear a voice for once i've heard a few things written at you let me hear a voice Thank you. I think these are four things that have proven to significantly harm a person or a citizen. The government will tax these to reduce consumption of them. Yes. It's the consumption of these goods affect two categories. They affect the consumer, the, the individual that's consuming them. But all four of these can affect other people that aren't the consumer. We call that word, it's a big word, externalities. You don't need to know that word off by heart, but it's a useful word to know. An externality is when someone is being negatively affected that isn't the producer, the person that makes the good, or the consumer, the person taking it. Because cigarettes, we've got passive smoking. The, the, the fuel causes pollution. Alcohol leads to higher levels of crime and, and violence. All of these things are, are, are scientifically proven. Let's have a look at this slide. I found this very surprising. I knew most of it, but I actually didn't know it all. I'm not sure what's happened at the very bottom of this slide, but anyhow, uh, nothing against the last sentence. I don't know why it's went slightly small, but th this is interesting. In the UK, 82% of the cost of cigarettes are government taxes. The government will raise 11 billion this year from taxes on cigarettes alone. In the UK, it is illegal to advertise cigarettes. You cannot advertise cigarettes and you can't even have them visibly displayed in a store. Smoking in indoor public spaces is banned. The average price of 20 cigarettes in the UK is £12.61. The UK is the fourth most expensive place in the world to buy a packet of cigarettes. I don't smoke, by the way, so I'm not a I'm not a cigarette guru because I smoke and uh, because I think this is really fascinating. It's the fourth most expensive place in the world. What I found was even more fascinating. The most expensive place in the world to buy a packet of cigarettes is almost double the price of a packet of cigarettes in the UK. So, Christian, you are our Australian citizen. Please don't smoke in the future because it's going to bankrupt you. It costs about $27, which is about £24 or £23, roughly to buy a packet of cigarettes in Australia. 
Anyone want to guess what the third most expensive country in the world to buy a packet of cigarettes in is? I kept this one as a wee surprise. Who knows it? Why would Mr. Boylan keep one country as a surprise? Miss Graham, it looks like you know the answer. <laughs> Northern Ireland, sir. Yeah, it is. It is indeed Ireland. Yes, we have got. Uh, it is the third most expensive place for cigarettes in the world. Um, I didn't actually know that until I un, until I did some some research. But actually, what's really interesting here is the difference. Okay, because as part of this, I did some research. The average price of a packet of cigarettes in the UK is twelve pound sixty one. It's not that everywhere, it's the average price. What has Vietnam, Ghana, Nigeria, and Pakistan all got in common? It's to do with this slide, by the way. What have they all got in common? I'm going to give you, I'm not going to give you an answer yet. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. It may be corruption, Guy Rab, uh, but specifically on this slide, I'm going to give you all a few seconds to think about it. Just this slide. I'm not going to give you an answer yet, because I like making you give me the answer. I don't think anyone can guess what they all have in common because I made this statistic up myself when I got the research earlier. I've never seen it reported anywhere. Uh, Aditya, what do you think is the answer? I was going to say they're all very, uh, they're all countries with minimum, minimal government intervention. I think so. What's it got to do with this slide? I think it means that cigarettes, which do cause negative externalities, uh, they're not taxed and they can... They're allowed to cause as much damage as needed for people to consume them without the government interfering. Adlin, what do you think? So um, I'm, just, I'm sort of debating between two options. So option number one is that possibly their air is slightly polluted because of how many cigarette smoke that is in the air. And maybe the second thing is that they don't really tax cigarettes and a lot of people have them and it's cheap. Yeah, what I couldn't believe today well, I did it last night, actually. What I couldn't believe is what I discovered about these four countries. These four countries are where you can buy a packet of cigarettes for a pound or less. Miss Graham looks in shock. I, I, I repeat, I do not smoke and I do not condone cigarettes. And please don't go off to Pakistan to buy a packet of cigarettes. We, none of us should ever smoke. But the fact that this is a government decision. Where, how am I bringing all this back? The governments in these countries have made active decisions to not tax these products or to put minimal taxation, whereas the UK government are 82 percent. Goodness knows what the percentage of taxation is in Australia. It must be in the 90s, possibly. I, I, I hadn't got... Um, I didn't manage to find out that piece of information. If anyone knows, please tell me at a later date. But this is a government decision because I go back to what's the original. Question. What is the role of the government? The UK government have decided that they want to do everything in their power to reduce the consumption of cigarettes. Because they believe it's really, really bad for the environment, for people's health, for, for the consumer as well as all the rest of us. And I completely agree with them. I go back to the question on tax. Why are government taxes so important? Well, simple. They ensure public services. The UK, like many countries, has got many faults. Anyone tells you the UK is perfect is telling lies or they're deluded. No country is perfect. But probably the greatest thing the UK has is what we call the National Health Service, which is a very unique thing to the UK. And anyone you ever talk to from the UK, this is the thing they're so proud of. Every person in the UK has got the right to free health care at no cost. Everyone. At the point of use, if you go to a doctor, you go to a hospital, you walk out with no big bill at the end of it. That's amazing. And, and I personally think every government in the world should be doing this. I, I, I don't know why it isn't. But some governments don't prioritise it. And it makes no sense to me. Nothing's more important than your citizens. Nothing's more important than their health. If you're taking their money... And taxes, the least you can do is look after their health and well-being, because most of us will never use the National Health Service very much. But when we do, it's brilliant to know that we can go and we can get locked after. And that is what, what I think is really interesting in public services, but it also includes the police. We want to have police. Some people don't like the police. OK, 
I'm not going to say whether you like them or not, but we need police. So in some countries, they're corrupt, and we know that. But you still need police. They're not all corrupt. You know, I know in, in many uh, countries, uh, corruption's in lots of public offices, but we need police. No one would feel safe if there was no such thing as police. So we need education. One of the greatest things in the UK is that all children have access to an education. Not every country has this. So at least the taxes, to an extent, are being put to some really good use. But we could say more money needs to go to education, more money needs to go to health. But the problem every time, if you give more money to education, health loses out. If you give more money to health, maybe there's not enough money for police officers. If you give more money to the police, maybe there's not enough money for the military. If you give more money to the military, maybe there's not enough money for foreign aid. And we've seen last week that it's really important we support foreign aid. And we've seen uh, the one year anniversary of, of the invasion of Ukraine and um, the importance of foreign aid and looking out for others when we need it. So, again, really important that we can these taxes are put to use. I want you to think about this. And I'm going to take questions and I'm going to. But I want to finish with a question before I take questions. Because actually, I've re I've reflected a lot in the last 24 hours and I've been thinking about this presentation. I've been thinking, do they get too involved? And I do think it's a bit mean to be taking 82% tax on cigarettes. But maybe, at the other hand, I say, well, actually, you know what? Probably fair. They're doing it. It's you're making a decision to do something unhealthy, and you're going to probably need health care in the future, so you should be taxed for it. It raises 11 billion. Should they be taking so much income tax off us? Because the more tax we pay, the less money we have for luxuries, the less money we have for going on holiday or buying a nice uh, new clothes or to go on for a nice meal in a restaurant. But again, if they don't tax us, we go to the hospital with no nurses, with no doctors. There's already not enough money in the health service in the UK. If you're aware in the UK at the moment, there is all government workers are basically on strike. The hospitals are on strike. The teachers are on strike. The ambulance service is on strike. Why? Because they are looking more money. And if they get more money, the government has to take that money from elsewhere. If Are they going to have to tax people more? Or they're going to spend less money on something else. So, so, so this is the question I ask you. I go back to this last question. Are the government too involved? Should they be getting involved in these things? What do you think, Kyra? I think they're already pretty involved enough because we're not exactly a laissez-faire government ourselves. And the same goes for law as well. If it was all be all, then we wouldn't really have regulatory systems or even statute in the first place. And we're not capitalists or entirely communists. So we do have a fine balance in the UK. It's a really interesting question. Well, well, do you think in other countries then, I'll, I'll stick with you for a second, Kay, right? So let's move it away from the UK. If we were to think about globally, do you think there's any governments that maybe are too involved? Do you think there's such thing as a government being too involved? Definitely Cuba, definitely China. And Definitely seen in China as it's even expanding over the US with its new spy balloon. That involvement is going over to agency secrecy and spying in the already Cold War brewing between two different countries. So yes, there is too much involvement. Take North Korea, for example, entirely involved. Yeah, and when we see, and this is why there is an argument for this, because when we see there's too much involvement in places like North Korea, we know very little about North Korea. A lot of things we know about North Korea, we're not certain of. It's very limited information there. It's very, very closed. But what we know for certain, if there's huge levels of inequality, there's often starvation and the living standards we know for certain aren't very high. So that shows you that too much government intervention isn't good either. Christian? I believe the government should give as much as it wants. It can give unlimited welfare if it wants to the point when they're not in debt. Because when you start getting into debt and you get, begin spiraling into debt, it's a very hard thing to get out of. I heard this person say that in, in Australia, if we were to begin paying off debt from today, it would take us around 250 years. And I do believe one of our um, previous prime ministers, Joseph Lyons, he died as prime minister trying to, um, trying to keep Australia away from that because a person in his party um, 
wanted to introduce all these new welfare stuff and it gave him so much stress because he didn't want Australia to be in debt that he died while serving as prime minister fighting for Australia not to go in debt and eventually that other person he got into power and led us to spiraling debt which now it's just uncontrollable. Uh, when when? So I would like to say that um, like Kyra said, so for example, um, governments are already in our daily lives. For example, there wouldn't be a prison. There wouldn't be right or wrong if there wasn't a government. There, it's like this. This is what this is what I mean. Is that the government already involves in our day to day lives? But some some countries, the government like want to listen to their own opinion or work on their own. Maybe they could they, like maybe make the country more democracy, like listen yeah, to the people interesting. more. I'm I'm going to do yeah. another talk with you by the way in a in, in a few months time on the idea of democracy because it's really interesting because we we have this vision of a democracy. But the one thing that slightly bothers me at times about the government is that 650 MPs have got the power to run the country with votes. So the, the people that are in power are voted by something like less than 30 percent of the population. And we have to maybe. But then we ask ourselves, should we have a situation where there's forced voting? Probably no. We shouldn't be forcing people to vote. But actually, it's a lot of power. For a small number of people when we know corruption exists and why is all do you think all people that get into government are doing it for the right reasons i would hope the answer is yes but i think we know for certain the answer is no in all countries some people do it for ego some people do it for money some people do it for corruption and the majority of amazing people do it because it's the right thing to do and they want to make a better life for all of our citizens. But it's a really interesting thing. It's a really interesting thing to explore. And we're going to look at that later on. But I want to leave you with, with, with really one final thought. The government are fundamental to all aspects of our life. They play an incredible part and a very, very vital part, making sure we are safe making sure we are happy and making sure that the public services on offer lead to us having a good standard of life. But I think we have to remember something. And I and I, as young people, I, I want you to carry this message with you forever. You decide the government. And I think too many people don't realise that. The government in, in, in countries that aren't riddled with corruption and nearly all countries are voted by the citizens. You have a voice when you get to 18 in your country. I'm sure it's 18 in most of your countries. You have the right to vote. You have the right to choose them people and you hold them to account. By if they don't do their job, they don't get back into public office. It's, it should be an honor to be one of them people representing a country. So I think we have to recognize the importance that we play in the government because a lot of people say, oh, well, that's the government. What can I do? We can do something because we have a voice. We can hold them to account. We vote. We choose the government. OK, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for um, listening. And I will see you all again very, very soon. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Uh, that was absolutely brilliant and perfect. There's lots and lots of applause going up in the air there. Really fantastic. And um, the one thing you kept saying was, I didn't know this before but I did my research and I know it now. And that's the whole point about our, our Think Big program and our lecture series. And we've got two very nervous L5 students who didn't know a lot about what they're going to talk about next week, but they do now. And um, so I just want to do a little plug for next week's talks coming from you, the student body. That's Flavia on architecture and Harry on music um, and they're learning loads just through putting themselves forward to do the talks. Thanks so much for the clever questions guys. Uh, really interesting. I'm always amazed at you and the comments and I've given you all five house points except Mr. Boylan. <laughs> Yay, well done.
thank, thank you, you so Mr. much. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Yeah, now I know he's got to go, so we shall say fairly well, and this recording will stay on the channel in, in assembly so you can see it. Okay, bye guys. Thank you, bye. Have a nice day. Bye, bye, bye.